session planning and administration, the representatives of His Excellency Governor of the State, and my own home state, my own governor's representative from Bauchi State and other states that are here present, other top government functionaries, members of the Wondo State Executive Council, and the Secretary of the State Government, Wondo. Distinguished delegates that came all the way from Bauchi and many other states, <coughs> members of the Senate, the university staff, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. So, first, let me express my sincere appreciation for this honor. For Excellency, the Governor, and the Vice Chancellor of the University, and members of the University community, who really invited me to give this lecture. <coughs> the government of Bondo State and the people of Bondo for the warm welcome that was accorded to us and all the delegations that came with me. I thank you for this honor. Very humble that we have this opportunity to discuss the future of health in Nigeria. I also want to appreciate the governors that sent the representatives to join us. There's a lot to speak about, but we don't have all the time. So my intention is to focus on key, few key areas. I know the detailed lecture is available and you can read it. I intend to place the health of Nigerians in the context of wider global and regional trends to link health to economic development and the demographic dynamics that are occurring in our country. To share a bit of recent history, some of the progress we've had, the challenges and a hypothesis as to how or why those challenges occur and end up suggesting a few areas in terms of where we move forward, in terms of health into the future. So first, on the trends. There are several important trends that are occurring in our world today that we can easily miss noticing them, but they are happening. One important one is the demographic transition. Populations are changing. We are getting older. Young people are growing up. The world and Africa in particular is becoming more youthful. Lots of youth. That is different. That's important and is linked to what I'm going to speak about the future of health. Urbanization. We're getting more and more urbanized. People are living in cities with houses, with migration, and there are implications of that. There are political transitions. Until now, really along democratic dimensions. But there are also transitions in terms of how governance interfaces with the people, how the state and politics come together. There are transitions in terms of the climate. Climate is changing globally. It's also affecting us locally. Flooding, we know what is going on with that. There are technological changes that are happening quietly, but they are important also. From big machines, we are now moving towards miniaturization, small gadgets. Mobile technology is changing a lot of things, from politics to how healthcare and education will be delivered. In the field of medicine, we used to talk about proteins, but from discussing genomics, we've moved on proteomics, even to metabolomics, to look at metabolism and how that is happening and how that affects lives, health, disease and death. But there are also economic transitions. With all these changes, economies are changing, including our country, Nigeria. The structure of the labor market is changing. Now what does all these transitions have to do with health? I think they are linked to health. They have implications on health, they have implications on the epidemiological transition that we are seeing. 
Today we have a lot of infectious disease burden. We have maternal and child health issues. But we are seeing non-communicable diseases come up. Because people are living longer, lifestyles are changing, and we are getting dislocated. There are implications for how health systems adapt to these changes that are happening around us that we may not easily really come to grips with until we take a step back and look at the full picture. We are on this planet as one set of organisms, but there are several others. Monkeypox is one issue that is very topical today. Well, monkeys are also part of the ecosystem and they have implications on human health. So, I believe you'll agree with me that there's very, we have to pay attention to bigger trends that are happening around the world, but also locally, and how they relate to our health and our health systems. I'll move on to try to link health and economic development. Why is health important? It's not only because of ill health that health is important. Let's start from the population dynamics. We are a large country, we are growing very fast, and that's good. A youthful population can be a huge asset. In a few years from now, Nigeria will be 400 million people. We could be among the third or fourth largest countries in the world. That's a huge asset. Well, but that asset can only truly manifest itself if the youth are healthy, and if they are employed, and they are also economically productive in those employment days. So, this concept that experts led demography, called demographic dividends, really about how this youth population can be translated into economic development for countries. Let me explain. I think for us to reap the benefit of the population that we have, we have to complete what epidemiologists call the epidemiological demographic transition from a situation where we have high mortality, high fertility, to lower mortality or improved child survival and relatively lower fertility. Let me try to explain that a little bit better. First, when you have high mortality of children, of women, and then you have reduction in mortality among adults or declining mortality among children. That's what gives this boost of the demographic dividend. The structure of the population changes. Initially, when mortality is reduced, parents will be more comfortable with lower desired fertility levels. Women would have the opportunity to engage in the labor force. When the workforce exceeds the dependence in the population, the non-working age population, you have the surplus, and that's the demographic dividend. So when you have high dependency, even a few working people might not be able to sustain the growth. The structure of the population has to be whereby you have very good, sizable labor force, but also a manageable, dependent population. And that gives you the boost, because then households can invest in food, in education of their children, in healthcare, they will save, they will buy houses, and the economy will grow. So when we talk about mortality reduction, not just mortality reduction for mortality reduction, but really link our own national economic development. So a few years ago, after I left um, I went back to the university to try to learn a few things. I asked David Bloom to work with me on some data from Nigeria. We took data from Dr. Kale, National Bureau of Statistics, population data, linked to economic data. And on some assumptions, model for the years ahead. It appears as if we have two distinct population structures in this country. The North East, North West and North Central, our population has been fairly stable. High dependency, high mortality, and also high fertility. The South West, South East, and South South, 
we are already beginning to get into later stages of the demographic transition. Mortality has gone down, fertility is also coming down. In South East, for instance, we are beginning to see aging, and that is increasing the dependency because we haven't got in terms of the fertility reductions. So what is the summary? There is a demographic dividend potential for Nigeria into the future. But that potential is not guaranteed. The asset that we think the youth are, without dealing with some very core issues, they might not realize, but might not translate into the economic growth potential that we think they can. So that's an important point. Second bit is that within our country, local policy makers, state governors, federal ministries, have to contextualize this message within the policies that they make in their state, in Ondo, in Bauchi, in Borno, and so forth, and other places, which includes reproductive health services, health child education, empowering women. Those are important elements for us to move in that direction that we think is right for us as a country. Let me come to now the health itself of Nigerian population. I'm not going to bore you with statistics because I know there are lots of numbers out there in terms of health of Nigerians. But we know, and I think there will be no disagreement here, that the health of the population, not individuals, the health of Nigeria's population is not optimal given the large resources that we have, the endowment that we have, the mobility that we have. I think there's agreement here. We can do better in terms of health outcomes. Mobility and mortality, both for children and women, is unacceptable. Malnutrition is still a significant issue, both active and chronic malnutrition, particularly in parts of the country like Northeast, where a portion of our children are stunted and are proof of that. We are seeing non communicable diseases, hypertension, diabetes, cancers, mental health, substance abuse. Those are issues that are affecting the population health in Nigeria. Financial protection is weak. Lots of people can get into deeper debt, debt, poverty because of ill health, because you have to pay out of pocket. Even if you have to come to India or some other places, unless you have pockets, you can get poorer because of that. Those who are ill are not able to be productive, so ill health contributes to poverty itself. Equity. As a country, we have almost eightfold difference between the wealthiest and the poorest segment of our population when it comes to access to antenatal care. This is based on DHS data, and I have provided that in the written notes. The twofold difference as of 2008 and 2013 between the poorest segment of the population and the richest income quintile. So we're not looking at just the aggregate level that is suboptimal. We're also saying within that, there's a huge dispersion. The poorer Nigerians actually have a huge burden of ill health, and they don't access the services that they need. While the wealthier are able to access and are much healthier. That is an important point that I think we should take into account. So why have we found ourselves in this position? Large country. Brilliant minds, understand is an example of that. But as a country, not as a unit, why are we where we are? I will hypothesize four buckets of reasons. One, I will link it to governance. Two, I will link it to supply side constraints, demand side constraints, and also lack of attendance to social determinants of health. So on governance, 1999 constitution gave us the structure of our federation, fiscal centralization, and we operate. And that also gave us a problem because we have a fragmented health system because of the way our governance system is. Meaning that the national health system comprises several subsystems interacting among themselves. So the federal government and its role 
really depends not on accountability mechanisms directly, but on really influence, soft power, help the states and others to act on this issue. Now here, I would like to pay tribute to several giants that have been working and have brought us to where we are. I think we had the name of Professor Olis Poye Ransom Kuti of Blessed Memory, the likes of Professor Umaru Shehu, Professor Etukumbo Lucas, Professor Ita Lambo, the late Professor Babatunde Oshotumeini, who we lost recently, 